Where is this our screening? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Oh, perfect. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Perfect, perfect. Um, so as we wait to begin, uh, how are the others doing vis-a-vis -vis this platform? Is everybody comfortable with this platform? Are they able to see us? Yeah, I think. <coughs> Is everybody able to join? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. yes it's very important to mute your uh, mics. I think uh, Professor Vijaya Ramaswamy needs to mute her mic. Everybody, okay, mute kar dijiye. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor Chahal. How are you? <coughs> Good to see you. You are very regular. Hai. प्रत्येक मीटिंग में आप शामिल होते हैं बहुत अच्छा लगता है सो शल वी बिगिन यस सर ओके डॉक्टर निमी यू आर रेडी यस सर आई एम फाइन हु इज द चेयर टुडे डॉक्टर सुमन दीप वेरी गुड वेरी गुड ओके परफेक्ट uh so uh, friends it's wonderful that uh, we are continuing with our academic activities despite the uh, lockdown uh, but i hope that the restrictions will ease in the days to come and uh, perhaps we might even be able to meet in our own seminar room early next month if the government allows us maintaining social distance of course i'm very happy that all of us are safe uh, and uh, we are taking care of ourselves and our uh, near and dear ones i think that's that's really really important i must congratulate uh, all our fellows for uh, uh, you know sticking through uh, this very difficult time with the institute with their own studies i see everyone's uh, actually making a lot of progress with their work now when it comes to uh, dr nimi we, uh, i just want to mention one, a couple of things she's been a very uh, active steady as well as uh, uh, should i say very very dedicated fellow of the institute and i'm happy to announce that uh, her research work is almost ready she's practically submitted it i found out today but what's important is she has an advance contract from a very very good publisher so Uh, congratulations dr nemi this is really good news we are very proud of you uh, in the sense that your uh, book is already in the pipeline now, couple of things uh, about about the presentation its title and some of the issues because what usually happens is after you finish i'm not able to you know intervene or join easily and of course it's time for everyone but religion literature and the other interruptions interventions and inventions this is the title very interesting title a lot of dr nimi's work involves a certain style of writing where the meaning has to be teased out it is very nuanced quite subtle but in this uh, work it seems to me what she's doing is she's calling for a reinvention of buddhism reinvention of buddhism in order to reinvent peace in sri lanka as we all know she comes from sri lanka she has first hand experience and uh, this peace making if i've understood her project properly this peace making involves literature because literature is a very special mode of human expression i'm just looking for the phrase she's using here i think i think she she uses this lovely phrase about literature where she says uh, upholds literature as a force capable of presenting offering giving creating and inventing being language and the world so in a sense uh, uh it is it is it is the marvel of language which she is harnessing to this 
task of peacemaking. I think it's a wonderful project. Uh, I think she she uses writers like uh, Sham Salvadurai, very well known from from the beginning when he started writing Funny Boy and so forth. I don't know what the other writers are, but I suppose Anil's Ghost by Michael Ondaatje. <laughs> other texts can be, in my view, harnessed to this project of uh, uh, invoking the marvel of language and literature uh, for the task of peacemaking. But initially, my only question uh, to Dr. Nimi, and I'm sure to others who are listening in, especially to political scientists, uh, you know, like uh, Professor M.P. Singh, is that though Buddhism is obviously a religion of peace with Panchashila and other very, very strong uh, <clears throat> injunctions against violence. What happens when it becomes a state religion? This has happened in the past, but later. There have been several times in history when Buddhism has been a state religion. Even in more recent times in Thailand and Myanmar, both Buddhist countries, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, they had terrible, terrible uh, wars against one another. If you go to Thailand, Ayutthaya, which is based on the old Ayutthaya, was destroyed by a Burmese inv invasion. So does it? So the real point is that when we come to, uh, I mean, I think Professor Rajveer Sharmaji can also come in on this discussion later on. But when we look at a text like Arthashastra, which does not rule out violence, I think many Buddhist uh, states in the past also adopted, uh, you know, the Arthashastra. So uh, the real point is, what does a Buddhist state do when it faces violence of an aggressor? What does a Buddhist society do when it faces uh, <coughs> violence based on ideology? Like LTT, you may not call it a religious violence. You may call it an ideological violence, an ethnic ideological violence based on uh, notions of Tamil identity, perhaps, and, uh, uh, you know, a narrative of oppression, exclusion, etc. So uh, the, the real point that I'm going to ask at the very beginning is that uh, uh, in this project of reinventing Buddhism, can Buddhism it's be reinvented without reference to these other contending, contrasting, conflicting forces and ideologies, both religious and secular, which confront Buddhism when it becomes a state religion. This is a question that, that uh, I have in my mind, and uh, uh, I, I, I don't know enough of her writing, uh, I mean, enough of her work. I haven't read uh, her book, her book, I mean, her research project, but uh, I, I would imagine that there are other writers than uh, Sham Salvadurai. And, uh, you know, Salvadurai is a very interesting writer. He, uh, you know, he shifted out of Sri Lanka as a consequence of the conflict. He's also queer. He now lives in Canada. So he has a unique perspective on this, on this uh, whole issue of othering, violence, identity, and language, which, which I, I'm sure we can, we can learn a lot from. But there are many other writers. I mean, including on Dutch. But I, I think that uh, these are just a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nimi. All the best in your uh, last month at the Institute. I hope you can, you know, revise and finish your project and uh, you know, <coughs> publisher, publisher awaits you. And uh, I, I hope you can make it the very best you can, because once it's published, then there's nothing you can do. About it. So this is going to be a first book. So congratulations one more time and go ahead. Please go ahead. I'm going to mute my mic. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, we have uh, the final presentation by Dr. Nimi today. So about her project, uh, director, sir, has already, uh, he has discussed about it. So I'll invite Dr. Nimi to make her presentation. Uh, please. Audio. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank um, Chair 
Dr. Suman Deep for being so kind to um, chair the session in such a short notice. Thank you once again. Mm -hmm. And then I want to thank IIAS and the, select, um, the committee that I selected and also the former director. And then I want to thank uh, Professor um, Makrant Paranjape, director, uh, being so kind, so helpful, so encouraging ever since I became a fellow here for my work. Thank you very much for your great kindness and help. And then I want to thank the staff uh, for again being so kind and helpful in every problem that I was facing, academic and non-academic both. And then my special thank, thank to uh, Gayatri Madam for being uh, such a mental support uh, with uh, her great yoga sessions from which I, I mean through which I found a lot of peace to write the last two chapters of my work. Thank you very much. And then I want to thank uh, the fellows, though some of them are not here, Professor Anita, uh, Professor, um, Professor Pradhan, and then uh, Dr. Anjali, Dr. Sutapa, and uh, Professor Narayanan for their, um, on the one hand, for, for their kind concern, and the other hand, on the other hand, especially uh, Professor Narayan, who made two important comments in my first presentation. Um, so I'm very thankful to all of you. And at the same time, I'm very thankful to all of you who are joining here for, the, uh, for my session today, um, taking your time and um, waiting here. Thank you very much. So uh, I have already presented uh, my first two chapters in the last presentation. This presentation would be more of uh, like an introduction plus uh, some of the points that I have tried to discuss in my third and fourth chapters. So in the towards the latter part of the presentation, I would be trying to uh, discuss what I have tried to do in my uh, third and fourth chapters, if not in detail, at least point wise, depending on the availability of time. Thank you very much once again. So the title of my uh, work is Religion, Literature and the Other, Interruptions, Interventions and Inventions. This work is an attempt to understand how we as humans consciously or unconsciously accommodate and consent violence against the other while trying to address our desire for ownership or belongingness. This desire, which is always a desire for self operative both individually and collectively, is often unaware of the potential harm that it carries within, if it is not kept under constant vigil by one who bears it. When it is unattended or not observed closely by calling it into question in order to understand the possible harm it could cause, it would end up hurting or injuring another while bringing happiness or freedom to self. Therefore, every human should firstly question themselves with regard to their desires in order to examine and understand the potential harm that they could commit against the other due to sin before beginning to question others with respect to their desires. In such effort, to be sincerely made through to one's heart, one singularly ruminates on how to define violence in an impartial or unbiased manner. When I say sincerely here, it is the sincerity, uh, here I refer to two uh, work, literal work, Proposed by uh, Makaran Paranjave in his novel Body of Women, where Dr. Ashok writes a mail to Ryan, the third person, so the response could be sincere or what we also suggest in the death sentence. This deliberation enables one to understand how he or she has participated, contributed, and consented in violence intentionally or unintentionally. Insisting on the urgency of understanding our own hypocrisy in defining what violence is. French thinker Marc Ripon opens his latest work, Murder's Consent on Accommodation of Violent Death with the following introductory paragraph. I quote, no critic of violence, no denunciation of cruelty to the extent that both the one and the other are partial and partisan, can elude the risk of consenting actively or passively, implicitly or explicitly, to the very violence it critiques and cruelty it denounces. It suffices that the critic apply only to violence and the denunciation only to cruelty that take place elsewhere and otherwise. This is the paradox of every protest, every expression of indignation, whether moral or political. 
No matter how legitimate our protestations may be, silence, the incomprehension with small and not so small concessions regarding the various forms of violence death that they imply or tolerate, which weave the fabric of our history, compromise death's meaning and their import. As soon as such protestation accept or even draw a line of separation between people whose wounds are judged unacceptable and people who suffer might be seen as terrible, they expose their lack of coherence with the principle they espouse. As soon as such protestations find good reasons for reasons for the destructions and they condemn Ezra, they lose their essential credibility unless we conclude that violence is natural and has privacy or considerations of ethics. We cannot, in other words, claim for some what we refuse to others. Our awareness of violence and its effects cannot depend on the application. Unquote. Therefore, it is necessary that any sincere effort that aims to address the question of violence at first should acknowledge the possibility of the same being inhabited by the above mentioned double standingness within the approach itself and should then struggle to guard it against the tendency to become biased or inclined, especially due to some fear of being judged by others for the very approach taken. And consequently, losing more than any recognition of identity that one has already gained socially, politically, religiously, professionally, or culturally. In that sense, in labor for non violence, by struggling to deal with the question of violence and in finite conversation that unfold between self and the other. Here, when I say the other, it would be the God himself, or would it be the one anterior to me? If and when one pays to such conversation, one mm -hmm. erupts in unimaginable mm -hmm. circumstances. Though there are innumerable examples which communicate either the reluctance or hesitance of humans to initiate such engaging conversation or the collapse of dialogue initiated in order, if not to stop completely, at least to avoid or listen violence against the other. The present work takes the scenario in post independent Sri Lanka as the backdrop of this discussion on violence. If I am to talk a bit of violence in Sri Lanka, the scene of this work on violence in post independent Sri Lanka, a question noted by Sri Lankan anthropologist Professor Stanley J. Raja Tampaya in Buddhism, the trade, religion, politics, and violence in Sri Lanka. The question was posed to him by his colleagues, friends, and acquaintances during his travel in the United States. The question is if Buddhism creates non violence, why is there so much political violence in Sri Lanka today? Unquote. The terrible question in Tambaya's world is competing. There are several ways to respond to this question. One way is to pose the same question to the interrogator by changing the proper nouns in the question and make the others. The problems in their own discourses. That would be a way to shut not the question but the one who asks it, for the question remains even in silence. However, recalling the possibilities that he could employ to give a befitting answer to the question posed, he says, I quote, I would reply that although Christianity preaches brotherly love, Catholics and Protestants are killing each other in noble environment, or that despite Gandhi's advocacy of Ahimsa and Satyagraha, there is much religious and ethnic violence in India. This is not a helpful reply, but one that can really put the questioner on the defensive. Furthermore, it carries the cynical implication that religion is merely an epic phenomenon and has little impact on real politics. Unquote. Hence, he takes a different approach to explore this question by probing the extent to which and the manner in which Buddhism as a religion is passed by Sri Lankans of the late 19th and 20th has contributed to the current ethnic conflict and violence in Sri Lanka. The question posed to Tambaya and the questions consequently raised by Tambaya highlights one point, that is, violence in Buddhist Sri Lanka. Whenever we hear this phrase, violence in Buddhist Sri Lanka, the first thing that it reminds us is the ethnic conflict between Sri Lankan Sinhalese and Tamils that stretched for almost three decades and finally got officially over in May 2009 with the death of the LTT leader, Veli Pile Prabhakaran. Either because of the difficulty in figuring out whether this end could be called or defined as victory, or because of the word victory is inadequate or incongruous to name the event of death, 
depth of war and also the depth of the terrorist leader. Some, especially academics, have made a bargain in the language and have set with the concatenation of some words in order to name and define the event of 2009 as military success achieved by the Sri Lankan state. If this war between the majority Sinhalese and minority Tamils would be seen only as an issue of political violence, the question that Tambaya encountered in the USA would not have been would have been different. In the first part of the question concerning Buddhism, certainly would not have been addressed. Here, the reason for such embarrassment is due to the link of the link or the connection made between violence that happened in Sri Lanka and Buddhism. In that sense, what is in question here is not the political violence in the country, but its connection with Buddhism, the official religion of Sri Lanka, mostly followed by majority Sikhs. Such connection is unexpected, even unimaginable, not because of the mindfulness of Sri Lankans despite Buddhism from the state politics, but because of Buddhism being a religion of non-violence. Now it is in question when the Buddhism Having dragged into, or should I say, having fallen into the trap of the Sri Lankan state politics and thereby being used on the one hand as one of the least fighting non Buddhist in Sri Lanka and Muslims, and on the other hand as a way to justify the violence unleashed against them. Now, this situation, which is like the other situations that have been happening throughout the world in the name of religion makes us wonder why do people fight at all for say religion when religion is to save people from fighting. On the other hand, even if people would fight for anything, including religion, is there a religious way to justify fights and violence? Look, this is the question the attention in order to come up with some answer that emphasizes the meaninglessness of fighting for a religion and the impossibility of justifying violence religiously or in a religious manner. Perhaps in sight of Gandhiji as a socio political, economic, and cultural reformer of the recent times, of recent times, could take the lead in guiding us to understand whether violence of any kind could be justified religiously. Gandhiji's profound thinking on Mahabharata of utmost importance here, since it calls for a different approach in the following manner. I quote. In 1888-9, when I first became acquainted with the Gita, I felt that it was not an historical work, but that under the guise of physical warfare, it described that duel that perpetual event on, in the hearts of mankind, and that physical warfare was brought in merely to make the description of the internal duel more alert. The persons therein described in historical but the author of the Mahabharata has used them merely to drive all his religious theme. The author of the Mahabharata has not established the necessity of physical warfare. On, on the contrary, he has proved its futile. He has made the victors shed tears of sorrows and relentless, and has left them nothing but the legacy of miseries. Gandhiji's singular approach to Mahabharata insists on the impossibility of finding a religious way to justify violence even if those acts of violence are enacted in order to protect one's own community, which would be named in terms of religion, race, clan, caste, class, gender, nation, language, and so on. So, really, what he must have tried to highlight is no religion produces a religiosity that would justify violence. Now, coming back to Buddhism, it is a religion that espouses non violence. Buddhist idea of non-violence, the concept of ahimsa, could be attempted only through a sincere determination of the self to be responsible to the other in fulfilling self-desire for happiness and freedom. Responsibility to the other in each action is found in the Buddhist idea of non-violence. The five precepts of Buddhism to be followed by laity on an everyday basis are suggestive of such responsibility to non-violence. Neither a tradition nor a sect identified with Buddhism could turn a blind eye to the very fundamental on which it is founded, Ahimsa. However, Buddhism that has been unfolding in post independent Sri Lanka shows a stark difference when it is compared with the one that emerged in ancient India directly in ancient BCP, insisting on non violence. The degree of violence committed to men under the name of Buddhism is soaring today in Sri Lanka to the extent that the fundamentals of Buddhism based on non violence have become received drastically. Considering the scenario in the country of Sri Lanka, it is 
We need to understand the propensity for such violence against non Buddhist in the country, especially in Hindus and Muslims. As a consequence of seeing a Buddhist religion, headed by Anuradhi Dharma Pala in the latter part of the 19th century Sri Lanka. The meeting of present day Sri Lankan Buddhism may be influenced by Dharma Pala's Protestant Buddhism, which later became the main protecting issue in terms of the modern Buddhist nationalism. Yanath of Vesay discusses how Buddhism has become a religion. That has been regulated to its founder without the humanism of Buddhist consciousness. Such dismantling of the Buddhist consciousness has occurred due to this and becoming, I quote Professor Obesaker, religion of the head by using its previous nature as a religion of the heart. As he argues, it is necessary to understand this process that leads to this dismantling of the Buddhist consciousness in order to grasp the type of violence in contemporary Buddhist Sri Lanka. Nonetheless, it is possible to argue that the purpose of the Dharmapala's mission was not to cultivate animosity and maintain in single Buddhist mind with respect to other ethnicities in the country, but to save and spread Buddhism in Sri and other parts of the world. Yet his mission becomes problematic only when one explores the ways in which he tried to materialize his dream. Dharmapala had taken certain militant approach to awake single Buddhists for rebuilding Sri Lanka as a single Buddhist nation and to liberate both Gaia from Hindus. His rebuilding, his speeches de delivered in Sri Lanka and other parts of the world as a Buddhist missionary and his writings, including the letters written to British Raj, communicate the very antagonistic attitude that he had developed towards other religion and their followers. On the other hand, he had also tried to persuade single Buddhist monks to inculcate and strengthen single national consciousness among Sinhalese, which they influenced on the radicalization and mobilization of single Buddhist monks into single Buddhist national politics and single jobs. This is the way it goes with Dharmapala's Buddhist revivalist project, which charged single Buddhist mind to revive the legacy of ancient Sinhala King Dukagama, written in Sri Lankan chronicle Mahavamsha, emphasizing the victory of single Buddhists over Tamil King Elara. Here it is important to quote what Mahavamsha writes about how Buddhist arhats console single Buddhist. Hero King Dudagamu, who was deeply disturbed, remembering the destruction of millions of beings, and thus was unable to be happy over this victory. Thus, Arhat says, I quote, From this deed arises no hindrance in the way to heaven. Only one and a half human beings have been slain by thee, O Lord of men. The one had come unto the three refugees, the other had taken on himself for the five precepts. And believers and men of evil life were the rest, not more to be esteemed than the rest. But as for thee, thou will bring glory to the doctrine of the Buddha in manifold ways. Therefore, cast away care from thy heart, O rule of men. Unquote. The message conveyed by these minds from the chronicle is bizarre, and no one knows how it justifies such violent thoughts said to have reached by Buddhist arhats to the king. Such stupid logic, which would no way be matched with Buddhism. Could instigate and facilitate only hate, religious, and violence among communities which are divided in terms of religion and ethnicity. In this context of Mahavamsa, such hate and disgust is simply directed towards Tamil since the king Elara is a Tamil king. Here, what makes us worry is not so much what the single king must have done during the war, over which he already repents, but what Buddhist Arahats told him in order to console him. However, when Dharmapala revived this ancient legacy of the Gyanu and thereby mobilized the Sikhana Buddhist to be with Sri Lanka as Sikhana Buddhist nation, this animosity against Tamil is too moved ahead with his movement. It is this desire to continue with the tradition written in Mahavamsha by appropriating it as the tradition of Sikhana Buddhist that continues to resonate till date, especially when certain Sri Lankan Buddhist monks begin to discourse on why Sikhana Buddhist. To refrain from worship of Hindu gods and why the ideas of Hindu gods should be removed from the main shrine at Buddhist temples. Apart from the violence unleashed by the ethnic conflict between Sinhalese and Hans, Sri Lanka witnessed another bloodbath during this time between Sinhalese and Malachis, and that is in relation to the JVP insurgency. As Jayadeva Vyan would argue, I quote, the JVP insurgency of 1971 and the state's military response to the insurgency was a major landmark in the emergence of. As a move of a political practice, mediation, and social control, unquote, in Sri Lanka. 
1971, JDP had operated their first armed revolt against Sri Lankan government under Prime Minister Sima Wandarman. It, known as the Southern Militants, revealed the bitter dissatisfaction of the young and unemployed. It was a well planned, yet failed attempt said to have happened due to lack of communication. Yes, it could not seize the power. However, the defeat could not bring death knell to the party and its mission. Second phase of its history began after 71. This Jayawardena regime started from 77 could not address the social economic problems in Greece during the post-1977 political developments in the country. The JDP was able to emerge as the main force capable of challenging the government in a violent manner. The tendency of the JDP becoming such an influential force in the country was also determined by its linkage with similar nationalistic activities, which were anti tamil JVP's single nationalistic campaign became more aggressive and violent in the protest of the Indo Lanka Peace Accord in July 1987. It states its protest openly against the accord, highlighting India's intention to occupy Sri Lanka and began a patriotic war against the government led by President Yamato. In this patriotism, violence was directed against leading figures and members of the Rudi Ukraine. Leaders and supporters of the left parties who theoretically approved the peace accord, former members of the JVP who were considered to be a threat to the JVP leadership, police officers who were engaged in anti subversive investigations, and ordinary people who defied JVP orders. Nevertheless, the government too strategically exercised its military power to counter the violence by the JVP and to annihilate the same. It deployed a number of vigilant group and death squads such as Pra, Pusa, and Black Cats to suppose the press the rebellions. These two situations during which brutality of hate and vengeance erupted against humanity bring us back to the question that was posed to come by young. If Buddhism preaches non violence, why is there so much political violence in Sri Lanka today? However, this study is not to understand who did what and who did what first if that what is about violence. The argument that it attempts to place here is no violence could be justified even if that violence is done in order to win love, equality, justice, success, rights, freedom or peace, either for an individual or for a community. It also then means that it is possible to win love, equality, justice, freedom and so on even by the means of violence or coercive powers. But the point to be emphasized here is what is there to have gained anything for ourselves individually or collectively if we have obtained it at the cost of the other? Be that other is our enemy or our friend or enemy friend or friend enemy. This question reminds us of what Gandhiji said in King Soraj in response to a similar question that aroused in relation to the presence of the British in India. The question was, I quote, why should we not obtain our goal, which is good, by any means whatsoever, even by using violence, unquote. Here the response to Gandhiji's expresses, the response of Gandhiji's expresses his concern not so much on what the goal is, since the goal could be anything, but on how it is achieved. He accordingly underscores the necessity to understand that there is a connection between the means and the end. Not to believe so is, as he points out, a great mistake. In his emphasis on the unavoidable connection between the means and the end, what he wants to do is realize how different means bring different results. And just to show, I quote, the fair means alone can produce fair results, and that at least in the majority of cases, if not indeed at all, force of love and pity will be primarily greater than force of arms. Considering the group force exercised by the British on India, Gandhiji argues how the same force could be used by Indians not only to chase the British away from India but also to suppress the facts within India. Yet the point that he attempts to raise here is there are other means, other than those of violence, that could be invented in order to obtain the desired goal. And it is to invent such other means that are of non violence that Gandhiji turns towards ancient civilization of India capable of offering insights on how to refrain from committing violence against both self and the other. Then, Buddhism is one such gift that India would offer to the globe in orienting people towards non-violence. It guides humans to refrain from violence through the practice of compassion to all beings. Sorry, through the practice of compassion to all beings. Everything is capable of such practice. If he 
His chief takes us to see a paper in the paper, or another, why there is a certain desire for happiness, freedom, and so on. Accordingly, it is necessary that every being falls its own self into question, not only regarding its desires, but also, and more importantly, on how they fulfill the same. This effort acts as an infinite responsibility and violence on the one hand, enables being to liberate itself from the cycle of hate, anger, vengeance, and jealousy, and on the other hand, empowers him or her to self earn love, peace, and freedom, which cannot be wrought or destroyed, destroyed by another. Then, for the question that I have placed above by quoting Professor Tambaya next, probing to whether Sri Lanka Buddhism has any role to play in aggravating violence in Sri Lanka. On the other hand, it informs the commendable role that Buddhism could play in order to lessen violence happening in Sri Lanka. Hence, the focus of this work is to understand Buddhism as a love and compassion that could intervene in addressing the question of violence not necessarily only in Sri Lanka, but anywhere in the world by directing individuals and communities to self righteousness However, the present-day Buddhism in Sri Lanka is far from becoming such a force of love and compassion since hate, anger, hypocrisy and arrogance of those who follow it have spurred sink into it over the years in a way that now it has become a force within which hate and cruelty against the other beings. If so, the challenge is how to invite Buddhism in Sri Lanka as a force of love and compassion. And the paramount concern of this book is to explore this possibility through literature. Here it is through Sham's work. Significance of literature for the deliberation of inventing Buddhism in Sri Lanka as a force of love and compassion. The discussion that highlights the importance of literature to invent religion, otherwise than the given way or otherwise than the way it has already been perceived. First, this suggests the significance of understanding literature as a presentation or unfolding of being in its immediacy, which in Brochure's words, the crude, rather than the mere representation of the world already out there. If literature is considered only as a modern representation, there is nothing else to say about literature. This it is only to represent what is already there. If that is all what it does or what it is capable of doing, it could have some value only in certain academic space created by language or cultural studies departments and universities, where literary texts are read, integrated, and understood in order to produce some knowledge about languages, cultures, and communities, and then probably to make certain judgments on those languages and cultures on the basis of what is written in a text. In that sense, a work of literature would more or less play a role of an implement or of a servant. Who could serve and contribute to the making of empires, including the ones in the academic world. This literature would continue to be a representative servant of colonialism, even if the master that it serves must have changed over the years from white to black to the dimensions of the thing. Magran Karanjati addresses this question while informing the underlying intentions of many academics, even from the so called third world, to maintain and uplift the very low citizen. The problem as in their selves. In a way, what he attempts to bring into light is nothing but the hypocrisy that lies within other people's places, whether these spaces are named as Western, Eastern, European, Anglo African, Subaltern, Asian, Indian, or Colonial. I have dealt with this idea in my last chapter in detail when it brings out Sham's thoughts on life of South Asians in Canada and other parts of the world. However, the representative character imposed on literature undermines what literature is capable of doing, especially without doing nothing. Therefore, this book attempts to insist on the force of literature, which is capable of doing something more than and other than what it is generally known for, which is a presentation of certain reality out there. This is not to deny the role that literature plays in terms of representation, because it too is one of those roles it plays, but literature presents. It is capable of presenting everything, including those who have seen. It is able to call everything into existence by calling out. Literature as both whole and whole. This ability of literature to call out and consequently to bring things into existence or presence in forms the marvel of language. Accordingly, the idea of literature favored in this book is the one that is concerned with writing. 
The act of writing in which literature becomes the crude word of crude being, in crude or immediate speech, language as language is silent but means speaking. In speaking in writing, means speaks freely. To speak freely is to say everything without holding back. Therefore, moment of writing is the moment of freedom in which writer is free to create a world of its own. There are things happen differently, differently than how things are ordered and expected to function in the given world of everyday life. But what happens there happens in language. It is an invention of language in and through writing. Writing is able to invent everything, including the ones which have not yet been invented. However, this writing moment is crucial since it differs from all other moments which have already passed or which are to come. And this difference of moment is a difference not only marked in and through language but also through being. Being in writing also being as writing. Accordingly, this difference in and as language is also the one in and as being, thinking and thought. Clearly, this writing is not only a moment of creation or invention but also is a moment of discussion. It is a force which destroys and creates at the same time. As Dosho shows, when the writer begins writing, his starting point is a certain state of language, certain form of culture, certain books, and also certain objective elements. In order to write, he must destroy language in its present form and create it in another form, denying books as he forms a book out of what other books are not. Such denial of what already is possible only in literature. Literature denies every world which has already been created in them through denial, negation, and or exclusion. The world survives on limits or borders which are set to negate or to control what happens at the limits or across the borders or what happens in the absence of limits. It is the world of subjects. Literature is not interested in what is happening in this world. If it does, it is only to express its discomfort or dissatisfaction with what happens in the world of everyday life. But it does not disturb there by becoming complaining or mourning, but goes beyond the world by becoming more than what the world already is and what is the world. In that sense, it is also beyond the world and the case of the circumstances that the world could not offer, failed to offer, or was hesitant to offer so far. Yet it is impossible to make this offering had the world not affected itself with these limits. Then literature happens at the limit, limit of being, language and the world. Accordingly, we are folding the commendable role played by literature in offering other worlds while informing the possibility of looking at the given world in other or different ways. This book offers a discussion on how Shams and the race writers regularly intervene in the situation of violence in Sri Lanka. Seven Grace is a Sri Lankan Canadian writer who writes in English. His oeuvre is consisted of four novels and two edited books. However, Shyam's most famous work is his first novel, published in 1994, Honey Bowl. The other three novels are Simeon Garden, Swimming in the Monsoon Sea, and The Hungry Ghosts. These four novels deal with the same question question of violence in the context of creating identity. Sacred characters in the novels are faced with the same challenge of being gay in a country like Sri Lanka where homosexuality is a crime. In Funny Boy and Swimming in the Monsoon Sea, Shyam offers to write the ignorance of a child regarding his own sexual inclination and his innocent desires to be the other gender girl. In the other two novels, in the Gardens and the Hungry Ghosts, the two central characters, Bali Guru and Shiva, respectively, are elders gathering with their sexuality, which makes them outsiders not only to their families, cultures, religion, language, and community, but also to their own selves. This struggle for existence amid the complexities in which their beings unfold in an unexpected and unpredictable manner persists violence against the other as the reality of everyday life in the context of being as subject. Here, Shyam informs the impossibility of defining what violence is, is it could appear or unfold even in the forms of love, care, and friendship. Coming back to the hungry ghosts, unlike Shyam's other novels, it does not highlight the aspect of homosexuality. Though it is necessary for the very unfolding of the writing being. Instead, it appears as the question which problematizes everything else left unquestioned in life, like both individual and community. Here, the writer calls several communities into question regarding violence Sri Lankan singular Buddhist community, Sri Lankan Tamils, Canadian, and Sri Lankan community of Singhalese, Tamils, and Muslim in 
had us. Each community involves violence in order to keep the community going. Here, what we let go of is the responsibility and care of protect life. Since the story, at least most part of it, is set in Sri Lanka, it presents violence that broke out in Sri Lanka, especially since 1983. Here, Shyam's take on violence is different from the way in which it is addressed in the world, where he describes the incident of 1983 Black July. The last pages of the novel unfold in the form of a journal in which R.G. notes down each incident that he could see here and free as a child during the ride. But in the Hungry Ghosts, Sham touches upon all kinds of violence that have been happening in Sri Lanka. Accordingly, he holds everyone responsible for some or the other violence happening in the society. In that sense, it is not only LTT, EJVP, and the Sri Lankan state who committed violence against each other, but also civilians who fought with each other in order to fulfill their personal agendas and desires in the time of a political and economic crisis in the country. As far as violence is considered, Shyam does not give importance to know who did what, for what reason, because such knowledge, after a point, cannot help to solve the problem of violence. Rather, it could aggravate the bloody situation since everyone could come up with their own good reasons and justifications to have acted in a certain way in certain situations erupted in history. Here his concern is, whatever the case may be, whether it is possible to justify violence ethically. In other words, he questions the ethicalness of any violence, even if that violence is committed to love or in the name of love. Here he does not differentiate whether this love is for some individual or for community. It is in relation to this question of ethics and responsibility in the context of violence. Shia insists on the significance of Buddhist idea of non violence and compassion. In that sense, the idea of the ghost that unfolds in the hungry ghost itself is Buddhist. That informs, on the one hand, about the one way to be free or redeemed by the other is right and beyond death. And on the other hand, the possibility of such redemption, if one sincerely falls onto the responsibility to the other, despite and beyond death. One of the significant intervention made by Shyam while writing the urgence for equality in the path leading to the violence is his question that upholds individual responsibility for non violence, which is in this way not bound by the norms of the community. For community good and violence in order to establish order of non-violence. Therefore, as he argues, the attempt for non-violence is always to begin from the individual. This it could never be attempted collectively, even if everyone in the community shares the desire for non-violence. The Bahamri was proposes every way to self discover the force within, which could empower being during the range of abuse of power while trying to address self. Since this book is trying to understand how Shyam's writing discovers such part of human violence and how Buddhism influences him in this discovery, which in turn plays a commendable role in inventing Buddhism as a force of love and compassion. Here there are three major points that I have tried to discuss. One is the relevance of Jataka's stories to read in Buddhism. Jatakas play a very significant role throughout the novel. As examples, the story of King Nandita to talk about the responsibility to the dead, the story of Thieving Hope to talk about the desire and the renouncement, the story of Obra King to talk about love and pleading for its love, the story of Demon Skali to talk about hate, vengeance, and forgiveness, and the story of Naked Pereti to talk about this idea of dana or arms as an indirect way to redeem the suffering soul. There are this, these are the sources through which Shivan, the central character of the novel, learns Buddhist approach to non-violence. His knowledge is crucial to transform him within, and for him, that is more enlightened than enlightenment. According to the second is, since I do not have time, I'm just rushing out um, to say the other two points we can discuss later. The second point is the problematic of idea of tolerance, which is here I refer to the Rita. A Christian idea. In the third chapter, I have discussed it with regard to the relationship between Shivan and his grandmother. A differentiated idea of tolerance from that of patience is discussed in Buddhism, which is called Kanti in Pali. According, the latter is not the one that becomes the reason of this problem, which is to do with tolerance. If instead it is the one who tries to care, to protect, hence to their even done better. That is, 
Buddhist thought of on patience. The third point that I have tried to discuss in the last chapter is the idea of forgiveness. Chan works, especially in the last pages of the novel, takes up the question of forgiveness. Then he raises the question how to forgive them and forgive them. Now, the discourse of forgiveness that unfolds in the novel is two points. One is how to forgive when the culprit is not able to accept his or her crime and therefore not ready to ask for forgiveness. The second is how to forgive when the injured or the harm is no more. In other words, how to forgive when the one who could forgive is already dead. It is here I have tried to bring the Indian idea of forgiveness and the Indian idea of forgiveness to the sea. While writing this question of forgiveness, what I would realize is that there is are images, wishes, or desires, something called unconditional forgiveness. Though he is not sure or though he doubts whether such forgiveness is possible, he hopes. But in Gandhi, it is different. He proposes it as both possibility and capacity. So it is with this note I have uh, gone into uh, discuss the last part of my last chapter. Somehow now I have already taken one of this. So I will stop my presentation here. Maybe we will discuss it further uh, during the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nimi, for your presentation. That very uh, comprehensive presentation. And in her presentation, uh, we can you know easily see that whatever she has pointed out in context of violence and the relationship of self and other is not only relevant in context of Sri Lanka, but wherever you know we try to establish a community or wherever we try to you know uh, form any kind of establishment in the name of religion or one caste or community. So that that there is always a desire or for purity or desire to re revert back to that time, you know, that golden time which we want to bring back and then that becomes the reason of unleashing violence and destruction. So I open uh, her presentation for, you know, discussion and suggestions. So uh, anyone who wants to ask any question, uh, please. I think that well, it is a very nice. It can you hear me? Nice. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. It's a nice. Yes, sir. Yeah, nice. It is, yeah, it is nice presentation. Nice presentation. But uh, I think there are a couple of points that you need to take care of. The first one is that uh, violence by some people who are Buddhists is not the same thing as Buddhist violence. I mean, look at uh, this religion. It has existed for about 2,500 years. And right now is the first time you find this sort of really large scale violence in the name of religion. I mean, there have been conquests by Buddhists and so on, but not violence in the name of religion. Whereas if you compare it, for example, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah if you uh, are uh, thinking of, let's say, Christianity. Now, in Christianity, you find that there has been constant, uh, there have been constant statements about why it is good to commit violence against non Christians. Mm. It starts at the time of the pagans in the fourth century, it goes on with pagans in Europe, it goes on with. What is the matter? What is the matter? Okay, so I think okay, that so this I goes think on. That this goes on. Mm -hmm. to say to say with uh, the, with uh, the assertion, uh, assertion to demand for genocide. For genocide. As such. These are uh, connected with religion. Those demands have never been withdrawn. And I can give you the references. So uh, that is really a religious assertion, whereas violence like, let us say, against Rohingya Muslims or so on, it is not really uh, a tenet of Buddhism. You do not find some uh, people who have uh, put that out. So I think that 
uh, unlike say Pope has issued a Parman, has issued a bull, uh, bull interceptor, bull bull interceptor. Minus and so on, which are actual religious bulls which have not been withdrawn to this day. So religious violence in that sense, you must discriminate from religious violence in this sense, where you correlate uh, the uh, efforts, I mean, or the, uh, the, what is happening in a community with religion, whereas there is no correlation. So this is one point I think you should uh, be very careful about. Thank you. Now, I think the second uh, second point that I would like to make is about the notion of the self. Now, the notion of the self that you have in Buddhism is a transient notion of self. So you live only for one instant. And therefore, the only reason for action can be karuna, compassion for those who come after you, including yourself or including some version of yourself. And so I think that this issue of self and other is not so sharply defined in Buddhism because the self itself is momentum, right? Yes, sir. That's, yeah. Uh, Kuldeep, sir, wants to ask a question. Can I come in? Can I come in? Can I come in? Can I come in? Can I yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Um, very poor echoes, echoes. I would like I would to like, 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 like. Sir, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am, could you please um, switch off your mic? Please do tell now. I think I can hear. Oh, now it is a struggle to buy. I think you want to. Can you hear me now? I've written it out. I typed it out, please. Is that fine now? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me now? I just wanted to say that. Can you hear me now? I'll pass. We are hearing you multiple times. I know. I realize that. I am typing question. Only one person should speak at a time and others should mute our mics. Then only we can listen to the questions. Uh, so one by one, one is her question here. So uh, you can read from here. Okay, nonviolence of Buddhism in the context of Sri Lanka has been on the back foot since 1948, when Sri Lanka gained domination, dominion status. The Buddhist monks played a proactive role in edging out the Tamils from politics. The Buddhist monks also acted as catalysts for the ethnic conflict by possibly setting up Buddhist images in Tamil shrines like Kadira Kamam. No work on religion can overlook grim political realities. Yeah, that is exactly what I have been trying to discuss. Of course, um, ma'am, uh, can you hear me? Vijaya, ma'am? I can hear you. I can hear you. So that is exactly my point is actually that is what I have discussed in um, the third and the fourth chapters that how much um, I mean yes Buddhism as, as Professor Raju point, pointed out rightly Buddhism never um, 
is like you cannot compare what violence in buddhist context and what violence uh, happening in the christian context but i am not making such difference what i am trying to say is that buddhism is a religion of non violence say it espouses non violence but that is what let's say that is what buddha wanted to but then when it comes to how it is being how it is being used i am using that word used because it is politically used it is used to justify the violence that they do to uh, silence another language another religion so that is exactly what is going on in sri lanka buddhist monks have um, engaged in this um, in this uh, project for many years so professor tambaya is one of them who has been working on it um, continuously taking how come buddhist monks get involved in this violence so definitely ma'am thank you very much for this question that is exactly what i have been trying to discuss though i am not too sure whether it came out from my presentation but this is very much a big part of my work thank you very much thank you colleague um, sorry he wants to ask a question uh, any other question please hmm? no one can be heard now yeah. no question then i would like to ask one more somebody else is there please go ahead yeah professor yeah Ram, sir please go on uh, this idea of uh, buddhism as a religion of non violence is not quite accurate okay. jainism was completely a religion of non violence and that brings a fundamental difference between jainism and buddhism for example in terms of intention so jains and buddhists used to fight and uh, in terms of intentions they jains said that intentions don't matter whereas according to buddhist intentions matter yes. according to jains and i agree with jains on that point that intentions are only expressed by your action you cannot have you know otherwise everything can be justified as well intentioned and there are some very dramatic fights on that so uh, i mean i can tell you if there is some time i think there is plenty of time since there is nobody else asking a question you know there is this debate where the uh, jains say supposing a person were to go to a enku and supposing he were to plunge his spear through the enku and supposing instead of a hand there was a human child inside and supposing he were to spear the child and carry the child on his uh, uh, spear and roast it over a fire well that would be a meal fit for a buddh because it was done unintentionally right this is the kind of ferocious debates they used to have so i think that jains were totally non violent whereas and that led to a problem it led to a problem or a solution it led to jains becoming the richest community in india whereas buddhists were eliminated from it and buddhists did not advocate total non violence they advocated i mean somebody asked a question to the both what will you do if there is some unjust thing happening so he said of course you will fight it so i think the question of uh, violence in the presence of injustice is not something which is denied by the book Now, i can't remember the exact reference i read it a very long time ago but uh, that is uh, i think the distinction between buddhism and jainism which also has to be borne in mind that if you have injustice that is a state of violence and that in response to that violence may be necessary that's the buddhist position if i understand it it's not that you must not have violence under any circumstances yeah Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, I do agree. Yes, it is actually the difference between it is kind of the difference between um, Jainism and Buddhism, and uh, the intentions plays a major role. That is where this whole idea of uh, forgiveness that I have taken into the last part of uh, my last chapter, because um, five precepts is all about um, promising to. Uh, do promising to be non-violent, but it is up to the individual. um how you define it that is exactly the point that how to define what violence is and what violence is not because it is completely up to the one who uh, intends to do something the whole idea of karma is connected with that at least in buddhist in, in, in as buddhist we practice those who practice um these panchashil 
they also carry this idea of karma if you do this you will also be getting it back but that is that is not really the way to be way to read it because in that case we also have this um, criticism coming from uh, dr ambedkar if you say in that case even the low caste people would be uh, suffering because it is their karma but it is not the case so that is how people define it but it does not mean intention has no role to play it is completely up to you to decide whether to in in that case and as, a, as an example buddha is asked uh, by one of these jain saints uh, so is it okay to eat meat so buddha says at least that is what the book says yes it is okay if you think it is okay to eat you can eat so that is exactly the point it is completely up to the individual to understand and to think how violent he or she could be in his own thoughts and actions this cannot be taken in a uh, in a as an collective attempt no matter how much one promises to be non violent the, the the degree of violence could be evaluated and double check only by the one who is going to do that so that is the problem and that is where sri lankan uh, the buddhist who practice in buddhism in sri lanka become in a problematic um, slot so it could be even uh, applicable to uh, myanmar and thailand so that is why this whole um, five precepts even it is um, not mandatory but everybody should follow it even while following it one says that i will not lie but while saying that one would end up lying so how to um, how to resolve this paradox that is the problem so that is what i have been trying to say even in love friendship and care which are generally considered to be so called spaces of non violence at least one would not want to put it in that uh, you know that category of uh, being violent these three things but even there you find lot of violence the first two chapters are all about how violence erupt in forms of love in forms of care and friendship in that way how to define again what is violence and what is Uh, violence and what is not violence so that is what my concern is too thank you very much any question uh, one more one more question you said about ambedkar yeah and karma that it will uh, bind people now this understanding of karma in hinduism is a little bit different from the understanding of karma in buddhism because you have a distinction in terms of the whole idea of condition coordination for each of some part it is not that you have to wait for your next life to rectify something the karma reflects in what is happening in the next moment or in few moments later or maybe uh, also perhaps in the next life but it is something which happens right now so merely saying that here is a condition does not make it binding on you you can get your nibbana at the next instant whether you are low caste or whatever it depends it does not depend on that so there are two distinct understandings of the notion of karma this idea that karma can have an effect only in the next life is wrong right this is something just corrected by me of course of course yes karma is uh, i i don't i don't think though i have to read i don't think buddha says it is only coming in the next birth you have to wait uh, for your karma to uh, have its effects uh, or something i don't think that is the way that is exactly what uh, shyam is writing uh, taking his grandmother's uh, shivan's grandmother into the scene because grandmother thinks that it is okay to uh, occupy somebody's land somebody's property in a time of a trouble and then she thinks because they suffer be they even as tamils or even as women they suffer because that is their past karma so even actually it is it is she who is making them uh, suffer but she is not ready to accept what she is doing rather she is ready to say that, that is their own problem and that is why they are suffering but that is a point it is not that somebody suffers because they are carrying some baggage from the previous uh, birth or so it is probably sometimes we are making them suffer so that point she is not ready to accept so when you are the, so since the beginning uh, to end i have been saying that is a, that is a question as that the self has to question its own being regard with regard to the instance regarding um the the instance that one takes 
uh, with respect to certain idea or certain action that one takes it is not necessarily um, you know uh, what buddha has said and therefore you do that is what people that is how people interpret it even in sri lanka like if you go if you see everybody uh, goes to temple and everybody vows to be non violent and everybody does such uh, huge things to uh, assert that but at the same time they do the same opposite thing so in that way how to say that this is a karmic effect that that is why you are suffering that is not karma that is you are your own karma causing another person to suffer but then you are not ready to accept it so this is a question that uh, that one has to deal with uh, so that one realize actually it is my action causing somebody to uh, suffer or somebody to lose uh, one's life thank you yes sir sorry uh, uh, may i please can you uh, one minute yeah yes sir please can't hear sir your voice is not audible is it clear now yes, can you yes, hear sir. me yes yes okay, okay perfect please may I ask a, a small clarification yes sir thank you thank you it's also in some ways related to what professor raju was saying i think you started off uh, in a i think uh, a very moving way when you said that we all have to first undergo a kind of self examination to ask if we are contributing intentionally or unintentionally or consenting you know uh, to a violent ideology or a violent whatever religious interpretation or a violent social practice so you know for me that was uh, quite uh, remarkable to start with oneself to start with a sort of uh, inner examination because what we do as academics is we create this barrier between the subject and the object and uh, then we we assume this extremely impersonal extremely detached uh, attitude to whatever it is we observe now what the, the thing i wanted to ask you is how do you therefore link up uh, questions of precept like what we were talking about karma it's a question of doctrine what uh, professor raju was pointing out and of praxis which is of our daily practice which is that you know as you rightly said you go to the temple you observe uh, you know all the rituals let's say uh, and you say buddham sharanam gachami namam sharanam gachami um, you know sangham sharanam gachami and then the sangha is saying you do this you do that which may be vile now my whole question is that how do you uh, propose to link these two these two worlds the inner world and the outer world is it through literature somehow and okay as a writer i understand because the writing experience is cathartic i mean many people here are writers so what you do as a writer is you can build a bridge between the personal and the political but now as a critic as a as a reader as a philosopher whatever of language how are you going to make this connection and there's a lot done on this already even wittgenstein is written on these matters you know can one feel the pain of another you know so okay let me just frame the question the question of praxis uh, which includes inner examination and outer empathy versus the question of doctrine and belief the gap between these two how does language and literature help us bridge them this is my question i'm muting my mic okay. thank, thank you. you sir let me um, try to answer the way i at least i will try to answer um, according to what i have understood from what you have asked i think um, in this particular case i think when it comes to buddhism what we have taken in sri lanka as i was um, referring to professor besekara that we take those canonical texts and the kind of interpretations given there but we except in um, village kind of a life we really do not take these jataka stories and the other kind of literature like which are generally not taken as a part of buddhism of course they are read only for some uh, lay people uh, residing in uh, sorry living in villages far remote areas of the country 
so that they understand what buddha had tried to say there by jataki stories have become um, kind of like okay this is meant for some um, ignorant people to understand buddhism but this is not buddhism at least this is the kind of ideas going on in sri lanka buddhism is taken only through those abhidharma pitaka vinaya pitaka and so on and all the uh, the the monks take these uh, books as the as the way to authorize and then to say this is what buddha has said maybe that is what buddha has said i do not know really but there are, there are another there are other sources which are not canonical or which are not really taken as buddhist text maybe they are like jataki stories the same jataki stories you can find even in ramayana because while i was reading ramayana i could relate certain stories and i found are they buddhist or are they hindu because they are somewhere appearing to be the same but they really can play a bigger role uh, if not to uh, create a kind of idea in terms of community but it can affect because this is what is this is what jataki stories do um, in general way like as as children we read these stories and it affect us like this story of uh, goddess kali sorry demon is kali is uh, is connected to the patini cult that obesekar is discussing and though we are buddhist we also worship uh, goddess kali and goddess kali makes a huge um, difference when it comes to sri lankan idea of uh, worshiping gods and she is taken as a, a kind of a, a woman uh, taking vengeance and some people go and uh, kill uh, some animals in front of her saying that she is uh, she is bloodthirsty but that is not the case the demonness of kali's story is something about what this vengeance what this hate what this uh, hypocrisy is doing and these things when you talk to some normal people they in everyday life they take them as a way to look at what they do at least in uh, late 50s 60s they go, that is the time they uh, become religious so to speak and then they start living with these stories and then those stories become very very um, they are like guiding uh, they 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 play a role of guiding people to certain um, way to look at how violent they have been and in this work um, shyam selvadure is bringing those um, importance of those stories to think buddhism in a if i may may say that non buddhist way because this is not a real buddhist would think this is a indirect way of thinking about buddhism but those stories jataki stories really play a bigger role if buddhism is about non violence these stories could tell you better things about non violence rather than those uh, abhidharma or vinaya pitaka or whatever that people would want to say as these are buddhist so in that i don't know whether i could really un- uh, answer your question but more or less this is what i have been trying to do the the kind of knowledge that jatakas uh, have been able to create and how it could impact on someone especially when one is finally isolated with one's own uh, exist- existential problems where one remembers what my anger could do to myself and that is where shivan remembers the stories that he heard during his childhood through his um, through his grandmother and that becomes a point that he looks back and check yes this is my problem this is no more a uh, problem of somebody else passing uh, or doing something to me my own anger how it is destructive and what can i do about it and it will go on i don't say that uh, this can bring a solution to non violence this can stop non violence but it could lead certain um, discourse or certain space where people want to think of non violence in a different way which is buddhist but not uh, buddhist in the way now it is being uh, seen in sri lanka thank you i don't know uh, other There than some question this yeah see this is by subramaniam Ambedkar, Ambedkar proposed a kind of Buddhism which was quite distinct from the one being practiced in Sri Lanka or Burma. He proposed it as the more human, compassionate, and rational form of religion, as in Buddha and in his Dhamma. What, 
what role does this version buddhism play in our conception of buddhism what role does this version of buddhism play in our conception of buddhism he proposes it as the more human compassionate and rational form of religion um so which was quite distinct from the one being practiced in sri lanka um yes i think yes it is it is uh, what um, dr ambedkar has said and what is being practiced in uh, sri lanka appears to be um, different uh, but i think i think even even i i don't know but depending on what i have read i feel though um, ambedkar has um, suggested a different version of buddhism in that sense i really want to ask maybe i want to ask this question um, is that buddhism that he is trying he has uh, suggested is really uh, so compassionate or is it actually um, having something else too like when i quote or when i began my uh, presentation i was quoting um, mark crepon and how our own protestations our own demands uh, which would actually appear to be very very um, non violent but uh, is actually the case i do not say that ambedkar did not uh, suggest such compassionate and uh, rational form of that same religion but i i want to know maybe that is actually the case because when we look at uh, what ambedkar is suggesting in his um, this particular work and i also read what vidu verma had read had written on him on his work so my question is somewhere even in ambedkar's buddhism there is a kind of um, kind of politics going on which is um which is one way it is necessary because it 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 tries to uh, say deconstruct or kind to undo the kind of uh, social pressure uh, going on certain kind of people in that way yes it is necessary and buddhism itself is a religion at least in in the time of buddha which was open to all pe all kinds of people despite uh, what their caste or class is in that way that openness openness is necessary but i think and i doubt whether this openness is actually there in any kind of buddhism that is being practiced today in the world including the one uh, which was uh, suggested or proposed or tried to uh, um what was brought by or suggested by um, dr ambedkar so this is a kind of question that i really want to ask because i find like when i was reading through certain things i find the same form of violence or the same form of exclusion is is still going on in them so in that way they are open and i think this is a thing that we need to work on yes all forms of buddhism unfolding today in the world are definitely still buddhist they carry certain buddhistness in that but at the same time they are not so open at least as the way buddha must have wanted them to be open they are somewhere exclusive they are somewhere um, self oriented community oriented and in that form of community they would be happy to say that our violence is not violence so this is the kind of um, kind of paradox or the kind of um, conundrum that we need to address really in that case i don't think even in um, even in ambedkar buddhism we can really um, think that there is such compassion uh, coming out uh, even there at least i doubt yeah uh, any other question somebody wants to ask question i think we don't have any more questions i i have i have i have oh my god <coughs> no i wanted to make a remark okay uh this right can you hear me yes sir no yes you can okay yes so ambedkar's love yarn if you have seen what he does basically a very major emphasis for him is to attack superstition what he regards as superstitions and superstitions being used to control people 
and that is what he is fighting against and uh, that is a major aspect if you see all the 20 tenets that he writes down but what is new about it what is navyan about it is the and that is an expression more of modernity because see islam already has that it already has that that you go only by scientific means you go only by projection you go only by anuman you don't go by shabda praman so when he's talking about science versus superstition it is a reflection of uh, what you might call modernity that these superstitions have weighed people down and they should be removed that's the major difference that he brings in yes. apart from of course the issue of caste and denial of hinduism that yeah but then when it comes to compassion i mean yeah the question was uh, the the i mean the question was highlighting the compassionate um, religion that was proposed by um, Dr. Ambedkar. So I was talking about his uh, version of Buddhism in that way, like how compassionate it is. I'm not talking about what he has uh, tried to do and what he has tried to undo from whatever going on. Yes, superstition, and that is a different thing. But what about compassion? So that is also a point. When we take out these uh, superstition or myths or whatever one wants to say, and then you take it out, and that is what Professor Basaker is also saying. I mean, at least this is what um, this is what exactly Anagarika Dharmapal was trying to do. He was saying certain things, like even worshiping gods, for that matter, is very superstitious in Sri Lanka. Like a lot of these days, even now, if you listen to a lot of uh, things going on YouTube, you can hear a lot of Buddhist monks saying worshiping gods is superstitious. But then, are we going to say it here in India that worshiping gods is superstitious? I mean, how can you say that it is superstitious? It is religion is not science. Religion cannot be science. If you make it also science, it could be a part of science or vice versa. That I do not know. But if you really make it as it is, how are we to address certain things which science cannot address in life? So that is where this idea of compassion, that is where this idea of my three karuna becomes important. Sir. So my question is, even those, even those Buddhisms, uh, including Navyana, which talk about all kinds of equality and so on and so, are they are they really into it, or they do do they really practice it? So that is the question. So it is not about superstition. Yes, superstitions are there, but people do follow it. But the problem is, even with or without superstitions, if you do violence, even it is science scientific. How to how to um, justify it or how to think it ethically, whether violence is ethical, be it done by Navyana or Mahayana or Hinayana, that is not the problem. It is the problem of question of violence and how to justify it and whether it could be justified at all. That is what I have been trying to discuss. Any question? I think we don't have more questions. So can we end the session? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much all of you who participated in the discussion and asked questions. And uh, uh, there is... You want to respond to it? Yeah. Which one? This last one. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Sudman. Yes. I have also I have also asked a question uh, via chat. Have you have you gone through that? No. What sir? I, I, I have also asked a question via chat through chat. So you, you please please read the chat. Okay. Yes, oh yeah. Yes. Religion is not out. No, uh, I have asked two questions. Okay, but to Ambedkar it is a code of ethics. Okay. Okay, now here it is. Okay, two questions. You must have asked earlier. Religion mm. is so. One question is religion is no doubt, uh, no doubt not science. But to Ambedkar, it is a code of ethics. So is that the question, sir? Was there another? Uh, another question is also there in the chats. Okay, let me see.
This one. Okay. We, well, while continuing, my question is related to another form of violence that is caste discrimination in Sri Lanka. You know that Sri Lanka is a caste ridden society like that of ours, and even Mahatma Gandhi was surprised to witness caste in Buddhist country. What about it and how, it, how to tackle it in Buddhist way? Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, yes, um, Sri Lanka is also a caste ridden society. Um, it is, um, I mean, idea of caste is very much there even in Sri Lanka. And um, as a, a Buddhist country, well, yes, people think that being Buddhist, uh, there would not be caste. But that, that, is, that, is, that, is why, that is why I am also trying to uh, write this work. If we are Buddhist, how come there is caste? If we are Buddhist, how come there is violence? So I really do not know uh, why this caste came or, and how it happens. But yes, in, in, in Buddhism, there is no space for caste system and it should not be. If it, if it is about uh, religion or if it is about uh, being compassionate, if it is about kindness, love and so on and so forth, it's not only about caste. There should not be even class. There should not be even uh, discrimination on the basis of caste, class, ethnicity and ethnicity and so and so forth but that is what we want that is what it expects people to do but what people do is opposite so i do not know what it could do otherwise we only can think or we can only think and question ourselves like as an example let me say if when you say this, when you bring this question of caste, now we understand, yes, we should not discriminate on the basis of caste. And then this, just imagine turning these tables to the other side and then see, when one gets, suppose I am a low caste and then I want to uh, talk, um, I want to say that how I am being discriminated. But then what about the kind of discrimination I do to another because I am being low caste. So I don't think whether there is, or, or I do not know whether actually those low caste people are nonviolent in their way of looking at the caste, caste people or the high caste people, or I cannot say whether high caste people are violent towards uh, low caste. Because I think it is not, it is nothing to do with the religion. It is to do with how violent people could be. It is not that Buddha or uh, Gandhi or somebody else has suggested not to. I mean, nobody has to say uh, that you should not, or nobody has to be there to tell you that you should not be violent. One can be one, in, in a way, I am, I am trying to say that one can check one's own self. To understand how violent one could be. I mean, that is where we go to Buddha or we go to God or we go to uh, wherever we go. That is about our own conscience, our own consciousness. Like if, if you make a point, if I talk to you and if I know that why I am talking and why I am saying this to you. And I should be aware of my own uh, intention, my own um, secret way of, you know, doing violence to you. So it is only you would know how much violence one could carry being low caste or being high caste. And I don't think it is and there is anything to do with religion, but one can use religion to justify one's own violence that is done on another. But I am saying Buddhism does not mm -hmm. say yes. Uh, you have given very, very much philosophical answer as you are. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm I, I, I don't think that uh, that could be a right answer of your, my question. No, that, 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 that is exactly what I'm trying to say. There is no right way. Only, only you would know what rightness or what, what is right and what is wrong. If you go by what is given and then therefore saying this is violent and this is not violent, then I do not know. So what I'm trying to say is that Buddhism as a religion 
definitely say um, that one should not discriminate on the basis of anything but even then we find how women were being uh, discriminated but if that is the correct word to use but again i do not know whether buddha actually intended to do the discrimination against women when he said no women should stay somewhere uh, you know nearby the those um, monks should stay nearby where buddhist monks live so i don't know whether actually he intend to do that but only thing is that that is what buddhism being open religion one can always interpret but when you interpret including dr ambedkar or including gandhi i i find gandhi as a, one one of those who practice buddhism without claiming to be a buddhist because he he practices non violence so i do i do not want to reduce this idea of non violence to buddhism because i don't think one has to be buddhist to be non violence non violent but one can become buddhist if one take to the path of non violence which is already uh, suggested or proposed by buddha so that is what i can say about what you have asked and about ethics that question of ethics yes it is about ethics that is what i am saying it is not about what you can do what and how much power how much power you can use or the abuse of power it is about when you have power how would you use it that is where the idea of forgiveness come in this work because that that particular point where this idea begins in the novel is that uh, the, the person the shivan is not ready to uh, forgive his grandmother because she has not asked for forgiveness she has killed his lover and he is not ready to talk to her but then his mother comes and say yes she has not asked forgiveness but you have to start forgiving yourself so i think dhamma plays or oh, dharma because in in buddhism we say dhamma i know there is a difference between dhamma and dharma but at least in buddhism we say dhamma and dhamma plays a big role in in teaching you in guiding you to a you to a path of non violence or of ethical responsibility when you have to say when you have to forgive you do not have to go by what others have done or whether the other person has asked think about dhamma that is ethics in buddhism ethics and dharma they are not two different things somewhere they are same i mean these are words use we use but actually that is the that is what exactly buddha buddhism is about it is about how much you could do to undo what undo your own way of doing um or your own how sorry how you can control your own power which you can use otherwise in a very harmful way if you know how to withdraw then you can use that power to subject someone but if you actually withdraw from it even when you are able to use it otherwise i think that is where ethics begin and that is where gandhi becomes important it is not about whether you can forgive or whether you cannot forgive or whether the other person is asking forgiveness it is about even without asking even without being asked yet whether you could forgive and that is only you can do and that is what buddha is saying everybody is capable of doing this and gandhi is also suggesting the same thing though there is a doubt sit so i think that is where ethics come yeah so um, many buddhism was never anti caste it is only question the claim of brahmins for superior buddhism was never anti caste it only question the claim of brahmins for what buddhism was never anti caste it only question the claim of brahmins for Ah, okay, okay. Ola advice to read Ambedkar's chapter on the four pillars of Sadhamma, especially the section of Maitri. Good point, Vidran. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah. Bolia. Yes, sir. I can't hear you. could you please speak loud 
Mm, no, I you, think there is some network. Your voice yeah, is not voice clear. Is, not audible. is it Professor Chahal? Okay, Professor okay. Patel. Professor yes, Patel. sir, please. Due to. Could you please. Um, your voice is breaking, sir. network issue is so could you please write your question yes. Hello? Yes, yeah. Martin, sir? Yes, sir. Now, now we can hear you. Again. Could you please um switch off our video? Could you please yeah please tell him what is going on? Switch. Yeah, uh but he's already on audio mode. He's he's not on that. I think there is network issue on his side. Sir, could you please uh, post your question, sir? I think so. I lost connection. I don't know. I can't hear him. And... Professor Hitendra Patel? Um, uh, oh, maybe coffee or you know. I think we should wind up or we should wait. What would you suggest? He has not posted. Just check whether he no, posted his no, question. No. Professor Patel, could you please uh, post your question? No. So I think okay, we can wind up. Is it? No. Are we? No, this um, Professor Hitendra Patel is trying to wait, but then. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Oh, he's typing. No, no, no. He is on phone. He is asking to type the message in chat. Sir, we have already asked him to type his message. I think uh, there is some network issue, so he is not able to hear us even. Should, I think we should wind up. Yeah. We can call him later. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for participating in the discussion and asking questions and for your suggestions. Thank you, Dr. Nimi, for your comprehensive presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. Thank you very much, Ashwinji. And thank you, my mom. Thank you so 